Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. Ezekiel, chapter 9. We've been studying about Shekinah. Shekinah. Brother Brett, where are you? There you are. All right. <coughs> Brother Brett, what does Shekinah mean? The presence of the Lord. The presence. All right. Uh, Shekinah, that's what it looks like in Hebrew. Shekinah, it's backwards, of course. Shekinah is a uh, rabbinical term. It is not really a Bible term, even though it is used in the Bible in different forms, but not the form Shekinah. Uh, I'm going to read to you what uh, this writer says about it. By the way, it's spelled in many different ways. With an A-H on the end, it, it starts with a S-A-E-C-H-I-N-A-I, -E or N-A-H, and uh, different forms because it comes from Hebrew and Greek, or into English, okay? Shekinah is derived from the Hebrew word shakan or shakan. In biblical Hebrew, the word literally means to settle, to inhabit, or dwell. And is used frequently in the Hebrew Bible. Genesis 9, 27, 14, 13, Psalm 37, verse 3, and Jeremiah 33, verse 16. As well as the weekly Shabbat blessing recited in the temple in Jerusalem. May he who causes his name to dwell, or shokan, in his house, cause to dwell among you love and brotherliness, peace and free friendship. The Mishnek Hebrew, the word is often used to refer to a bird's nesting in nests. To a bird's nesting in nests. Remember when Jesus was on the mount, up on the looking, the mount, looking over to, he, to uh, Jerusalem upon the Mount of Olives, and he said, how many times I would have walked? called or clucked to you. I want a mother hen, when her babies are in danger or she finds some good morsel, she'll go and they'll run. Just you just look, I mean they instantly run. Many times I would have called you, but you would not come. Alright? And then Genesis 1 and 2. Some non read uh, Genesis 1. Brother Bill, you got that Hebrew? Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 and 2. That's pretty good, I think. Read Genesis the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was mourning over the face of the waters. Okay, that means mourning over. It means brooding over. It means uh, uh, to suffer. It means to uh, like germinate, like a, an incubate, like a mother hen does or a, or a bird or any type of a fowl. Uh, every bird nest, he says, with its kind, and man with his kind. And uh, also could mean a neighbor. If a neighbor is a scholar, they say, in the Talmud. Uh, the word Shekinah also means royal, or royal presence, or royal dwelling place, like a palace. Okay? The Greek word is skene. Where is my Greek word? Right there. Skene. All right, and John 1.14, let's go to John 1.14, let's look at this word. John 1.14. John 1.14. Uh, Brother David, quote that for me in Greek, would you? Brother David, John 1.14. Oh, 1.14? Yeah. All right. Kaihologosarxagenito. Oh, thank you. Kaihologosarxagenito is how that verse starts off. Uh, all right, now let's look at this. Because this is very important. It's going to go right toward the lesson where we are today, okay? Uh, Brother John, are you over there in John 1, 14? Mm -hmm. Could you read that for me, please? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, now what this is talking about here, it says, Kaholo go sarks again until, and the Word, and the Jehovah flesh He became. That's what it literally says. And he eskene, he shekinah. So here we have Jehovah, the Havavar, or the Word of God, the Hashem, or the name, the personal name of God, 
And it says here, and he became flesh, and he shekinahed among us, and we beheld as on a stage, is what it says there. Ethosimatha. He, we beheld the glory, the doxa, we get our word doxology from that, of him, the glory, as the only generated from beside the Father, full of grace and truth, Alethea, grace and truth. All right, that's beautiful. Now let's go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. <coughs> Ezekiel. What chapter again? Ezekiel 9 and verse number 3. Ezekiel 9 and verse number 3. Young lady, what is your name? I can't remember. Nita. 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 Are you over there in Ezekiel? Yeah. All right. 9 and verse number 3. <coughs> then the glory of the God of Israel rose up from between the cherubim where it had rested and moved to the entrance of the temple. And the Lord called to the man dressed in linen who was carrying the writer's case. All right, now here we have the glory of the Lord. What is this then? How, how could we translate this? How could we interpret this? This is what? The Shekinah means the physical presence of God. All right? And in Hebrew, the Hebrew scholars say it is the feminine attributes of the presence of God. The nurturing attributes. And El Shaddai means what? El Shaddai. Nourishing one? The nourishing one. The Almighty, but the nourishing one. El Shaddai. Shaddai comes from uh, the word breast, so it is a nourishing one. Like the hen broods over and mourns over and just puts all of her life in the eggs that she's going to have to, she will die to protect those eggs. This is the attributes of God. <coughs> The, what we call the feminine. Now, God is masculine. He's not feminine, okay? But this is, it, it's using what we call a condescension where God goes down into human terms where we can understand a little bit about God in this way, this nurturing factor. Genesis 1 and 2 there, it says, uh, Genesis 1 and 1, Barashith, Bara, Elohim, Et HaShemayim, We Et HaArens. And the, in beginnings created God, uh, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says, in the earth she became formless and void. And then Spirit God went out to, to reconstruct, to gather up the pieces, to regerminate, to brood over and mourn over the faces of the deep, it says, El Tanei Tahom. All right? And here we have the glory of God, went up from the cherubim. Where's the, what's the cherubim? What is that? Cherubim. Cherubim. Cherubim, as I'm saying. Um, all right here. The cherubim was right here at the mercy seat. The Shekinah glory of God, the one that led Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. All those 40 years of wandering, the Shekinah glory led Israel. All right. And after they built, now this is the tabernacle here, they built the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory of God just engulfed that tabernacle. It was already built. It was already there. And God took possession of it and showed that His presence was there. This is where He was going to be found. All right? He's, that's where He's going to be found. Then in the, later on in Solomon, when Solomon built the temple, they moved the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, the Shekinah glory and all this, it was only in the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant and that Shekinah glory did not come back to Israel until Jesus was born. It was never in Herod's temple, except when he walked near it and around it. Never in the temple, but in the outer courts of the temple. The Shekinah glory, and that Shekinah glory was in uh, Solomon's temple, and that's what we're studying right now in Exodus the ninth, or in uh, Ezekiel the ninth chapter. Now uh, let's go over to. Uh, well, just read number four. <coughs> John, are you still there? Or, oh, that was uh, Nina? Yes. Yeah. And four, verse four. He said to him, Walk through the streets of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of all who weep and sigh because of the detestable sins being committed in their city. All right, now, 
the prophet of God here told this man to go through the city and to uh, mark, put a mark on the foreheads of all that were mourning because of the sins that Israel was committing. You know, there has always been uh, a few uh, faithful ones. In the Laodicean church age that we live in today, there are a few faithful people. <laughs> we know that there are some faithful ones. Basically, the church is doing exactly what it wants to do today. Laodicea. Laodicea means what? Laodicea. What? Seeing your own eyes. Doing your, doing what you're doing your own thing. They're doing their own thing. All right. <coughs> What's right in their own eyes? All right. That's the church, the Laodicean church age. But there are going to be some faithful people. Uh, right here, there were some faithful people. Now go to Revelation, since uh, the book of Ezekiel is highly, uh, what we call that, eschatological. What does that mean? Eschatological. Huh? Study of death. The study of end times. All right, so let's go to the, another book of end times, the book of Revelation. Okay? Revelation... Uh, the seventh chapter. Seventh chapter. Seventh chapter. And verse number one. Betty, you, you over there yet? <coughs> it's good to have you back here after oh, not that. seeing you. Yes. My two cousins. Right? So seven one. Yeah. It starts out with meditate. Can you say that? Meditate. Meditate. Yeah. That's after these things. That's that's one of John's favorite terms right there. Okay. Go ahead. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that, that the wind would not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now this is during the tribulation period, people. This is really some bad time now. Go on a little further. And I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. All right, go on a little further. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. All right, sealed the bond servants of God on their foreheads. All right, the bond servants of God on their foreheads. So we have something here. We have something relating... Right back to the book of uh, Ezekiel, don't we? Just like. There have been, people are being sealed. Okay? They're being sealed. Now let's go on a little bit further. Verse number 9. Go on down to verse number 9 in the book of Revelation. Alright? And it starts out again. What? In Greek. John's favorite term. Metatot. After these things. He just keeps using that term over and over and over again. Uh... Brother Art, are you there? Yeah. Happy thing is to look and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, all tribe and people and tongue, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed in white robe, and palm branches were in their hand. Okay, keep on going. Okay. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the land. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their face before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, to be our God forever and ever. Amen. Okay, go on down to verse number 14, Brother Rex. Then I said to him, My Lord, you know, you might leave that other one out. Oh, yeah, just, just jump on right on down here. <laughs> okay. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. All right. Now, when you when you wash robes uh, that are white with blood, they don't usually turn out white, do they? <laughs> what in the world is this talking about? It's talking about salvation, the blood of the Lamb, our Savior. Verse number 13, And one of the elders answered and saying to me, These are the ones clothed in white robes, which are they, or which... Uh, uh, from where did they come? And he said, I said to them, my Lord, uh, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
And for this reason they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on the throne, shall spread his tabernacle over them and they shall hunger no more. Why? These people, now there's different groups of saved people in eternity. I'm telling you, they're not all the same. Uh, is everybody in hell just in hell in the same place in, in hell? What did Jesus say? It would be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be you rascals here walked around the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Ga uh, Galilee means what? Circle. Circle. All around that circle where Jesus ministered, they saw the Messiah. They saw God the Son. They saw Jehovah in the flesh walking around there proving who he was. And how, what did they want to do to him? What did they do down in Nazareth when he stood up in Nazareth and he said, This day these words are fulfilled in your hearing. What did they want to do to him then? Stone him. Stone him, kill him. Do you think that they didn't know who he was? I beg your pardon. They knew exactly who he was. They knew when he was born, where he was born, and everything about him. But they didn't want him. He's going to change our religion and take our nation away from us. Even the disciples didn't really understand too much about him. Now let's go back here and look in the book of Ezekiel now. Book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, Isaiah. All these books are what we call of, full of eschatology, end times. And since we're living awfully close to the end times, <laughs> we ought to pay a little more attention to it. We've been looking at the book of Ezekiel pretty closely here. All right. Go through the city after him a strife. Do not let your eye have pity, in verse number 5, in Ezekiel 9. Utterly slay old men, young maidens, little children, women. Do not touch my, uh, uh, do not touch any man on whom the mark, and the, you shall start from my sanctuary. And so they started with the elders, and they were before the temple, and he said unto them, Defile the temple. They have defiled the temple. The priests were like pagans. They had defiled the temple. And he said, now I want you to defile it. How? Go out as they went and they struck down the people. All the dead people. There were dead people laying all over the place. Is that as they were striking, I alone was left in verse number 8. And that I fell on my face and cried out, Alas, Lord God, are you destroying the whole remnant of Israel by pouring out your wrath on Jerusalem? And he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very, very great. And the land is filled with blood, and the city is full of what? Twisted, perverted. We get our word pornography from this word when you go back to the Septuagint. And they shall say, The Lord has forsaken and the land, and the Lord does not see. I want you to understand it. The Lord has forsaken, and the Lord does not see. That word's gyre in Hebrew right there, gyre. What does gyre mean? In the Genesis, the 22nd chapter, it talks about Jehovah gyre. Okay, gyre means to see. It also means to provide and to protect. El Shaddai. Remember what that term means? El Shaddai. And remember the word Shekinah. That presence of God that nurtures and gives life. <coughs> Lord does not see you. Jehovah Jireh. He doesn't provide. He didn't provide for them. They forsook him and he forsook them. But as for me and my eye will not have pity, and nor shall I spare, but I shall bring their conduct upon their heads. I'm going to return their conduct to their heads. They asked for it, and they got it. You asked for it, let's see why you like it. Now, in the 10th chapter. In the 10th chapter. And verse number 1. Uh, Brother Bill, are you there? Yeah, verse 1. Yeah, ten and one. And it looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Okay, now, what about Shekinah now? What does Shekinah mean? The physical presence of God, and what else? 
royal residence. You go back to the book of Revelation again, you see a royal residence where the rainbow, it's called the rainbow throne. Rainbow throne. By the way, the word rainbow has come from iris in Greek. It's like the iris of your eye. The color of your eye. The rainbow throne. And it, it, the throne is sitting on a crystal sea. It says, the crystal sea. What it is, is a diamond. The pavement that the throne sets on is diamond. It's a diamond. One big polished diamond and the throne of God. Now what do diamonds do? What when you when you have a very good quality diamond that's very clear, what does it do? What does it do? Sparkles with different colors. It reflects beauty and light. It'll reflect beauty and light. So the rainbow throne rainbow throne of God is reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the presence of him. Okay, his presence. Right? Now here we have the throne of God. Now during this period of time, Israel was very, very privileged because the throne of God was above the cherubim in the, temp in the temple. They had the presence of God there. He was dwelling with them. Then they appreciate it. They polluted that place. That's why even Solomon, if you, right here, and this picture here, we're, this picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. Have you been over there? It's a beautiful when you look back over to the city of Jerusalem. But you look over there and you see just paganism. Ungodliness today. Paganism. You look over there. Now, Solomon, and it's higher than Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is higher than Jerusalem. Think about this for a while. <coughs> Looking down on the temple of God were pagan temples that Solomon built for his pagan wife. His pagan wife. Now here we have this resembling the throne of God. We see the glory of God. It's resting and dwelling over the Ark of the Covenant. And 1 John 2 and 2. Go to 1 John 2 and 2. These are very familiar verses with you. 1 John 2 and 2. Are you over there, uh, uh, Anna? 1 John 2 and 2. Anyone at 1 John 2 and 2? 1 John 2 and 2. Dr. John, are you over there at 1 John 2 and 2? I just barely got you getting the door. I'm putting you to work, brother. 1 John 2 and 2. 1 First John two and two. That's a beautiful verse. It talks about the uh, it talks about the mercy seat. I got it. That term right there. Well, I'm gonna let Brother John do it. Brother John. We got two Johns in right now. And we're gonna do First John right now. Yes, sir. First John. Because <laughs> you were here first. <laughs> first John two and two. And he himself in the propitiation for our sins and not our and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. All right. This is talking about Jesus. It's talking about, here we have the, the, the writer, John the writer, John the apostle. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of Revelation. Okay? And in all of these books, it calls Jesus the Logos, or the Jehovah. This is the personal name of God. He's, this is God in our presence now. Now what does he say about this? Now where did the Shekinah glory dwell? Over the mercy seat. Now in Greek there, go ahead brother John, do it again. The same one? Yes, same and one. And he himself is the propitiation. He himself is the mercy seat. That's the mercy seat to set on the Ark of the Covenant. That's the term. Hilosmos, Hilosterion. That's the term. He is our mercy seat. What happened here at the mercy seat once a year on the day of Yom Kippur? Huh? That's the day of atonement. That's the day of covering. Okay? They would bring in the blood, and this is where the forgiveness would take place. He is our mercy seat for not us only, but for the what? For the whole entire universe. It says also in the book of Romans that the creation itself cries out for redemption. 
Now the creation, I'm going to tell you something. The creation, the animals, the creation, all the creation of God kind of got sold into sin whether they wanted to go there or not. The whole creation got sold into sin. The first rascal that tore them up was Lucifer, wasn't it? Go way back over there in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Lucifer destroyed and tore up the creation. And then God set it back in order again. And the Messiah came back to redeem it all. John 3.16 says, For God so what? Let the cosmos. The cosmos. The whole created order. He's going to redeem it all back. All of it. All of it back. Read that one more time, Dr. John. Are you still there? Yes, sir. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That's right. To redeem it all back to himself. He's doing a good job, people. When he came to the cross of Calvary, and when he was raised from the grave, he did a real good job. He's going to finish it one of these days, right back over yonder. All right? And finish the job completely up right there. All right? I looked and behold, 10 and verse 1, and behold in the expanse. That's the breathing space. The expanse over it, all right? And it was over their heads and the cherubim and something like a sapphire stone, appearing appearance resembling the throne, appearance above them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Enter between the whirling wheels under the cherubim. The cherubim. By the way, it's always plural. Always plural. Now, by the way, we have two cherubim right here, don't we? Two angels. Angels are witnesses. In the Old Testament it says by two or three witnesses, let everything be established, doesn't it? When we're born into this world, I believe there's witnesses of angels saying, hey, uh, Mark was born. He's here. And then, when we're born again, there's two witnesses, like at the mercy seat, saying, hey, Mark was born again. And then when you die, God sends those angels. In Luke, the 16th chapter, who came after Lazarus? The angels gathered him up into Abraham's bosom, which now is heaven. All right? Angels. Angels means more than one, doesn't it? So maybe it's the same two witnesses that bore witness to his salvation. Now verse number three, Now the cherubim was standing on the right side of the temple. And the man entered the cloud, filled the man entered, and the cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah. Now when Jesus was on earth, this earth, there was Shekinah there. He, he appeared in his full Shekinah glory. Where? On the mount of what? Transfiguration. All right, and they saw his full glory. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim to the threshold of the temple. All right, what is the threshold? God's getting ready to leave that ungodly bunch. I don't have a... I had a picture of the temple up here somewhere, but I don't want to have to. Now somebody must have borrowed it. Well, anyway, he went like to the threshold of the temple. This is the tabernacle, but the threshold of the temple. Now he's getting to walk out of there. He's getting ready to walk out of there. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with a cloud, and the glory was filled, uh, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. This is Shekinah, the very presence of God, the physical presence of God. Now, moreover, the sound of the wings of the cherubim were heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of uh, what? What's that say over there, Brother Bill, in that Hebrew Bible? Which one again, Jim? Uh, 10 and verse 5 at the end of that verse. 10 and verse 5. 10 and 5. And You've got the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even in the outer court like the voice of Almighty God when He speaks. Okay, that's not what I want. Somebody look over there to the edge of your Bible and your study Bible over there someplace. <laughs> it's going to tell you what that says. 
Look over to the end. That, that, they didn't, did they miss the ball there, Bill? Are you in that Hebrews? Nine, no, I'm in, I'm in it's the New King James. Nine, oh, we, oh, I'm you talking mean, about that other one. Oh, oh you mean... Yeah, so where is it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look that one up. And as he's looking up, I'm going to tell you what it says in Hebrew. El Shaddai. El Shaddai. El Shaddai is the all-powerful, the all-nourishing one. All right? And I tell you the truth, Bill, read it. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was, was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of El Shaddai when he speaketh. All right, the voice of El Shaddai. Who was speaking up on top of the uh, Mount Sinai that shook the ground? What verse is that one? That's El Shaddai. On. Ezekiel 10 and 5. All right, 10 and 6. And it came about when he had commanded the man clothed in linen, Take fire from between the whirling wheels and between the cherubim. And he entered in and stood beside the wheel. Then the cherubim stretched out his hand. And the cherub stretched out his hand between the cherubim to the fire which... Now here we have a cherub. That's an angel with wings, by the way. The cherubim are those two witnesses. That's plural. Alright? Stretched out his hand between the cherubim and the fire between the cherubim and took some of the and put it into the hands of one clothed in linen who took it and went out. And the cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. Okay? Then I looked, and behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels were like the gleam of a uh, barrel stone. All right? Like a precious stone that you could see in that reflects light, that's colors. And what about New Jerusalem? What is the foundation of New Jerusalem like? These different beautiful colored stones. And as far as the appearance of all four of them had the same likeness of one wheel, uh, wheels that were in another wheel. And they moved wherever they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, and they followed in the direction which they faced without turning as they went. What in the world is this? What is this thing? This is a representative of God's omnipresence. That omnipresence means what? Mm. These ever work. How about omniscience? You know, there's three attributes of God. He knows everything. Yeah, he knows everything. And he's there every place. And this is what it's doing. It's showing you this is what we call a theophany. It's displaying God. Okay? And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and their wheels were full of eyes all around and the wheels belonging to all four of them. And the wheels uh, were called, in my hearing, the whirling of the wheels. What happened on top of Mount Sinai? Those Jews down below Sinai, he, he told them to come up there. The heads. And they said, no, just Moses, you go up there. We don't want any part of this. And then while they were down there, they were doing just exactly what they did later on in, in Jerusalem. Well, Moses was up on the hill, and the prophet of God was down there. Who did all the miracles in Egypt? Aaron. 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 Who was down there? Aaron, like an old cat. Oh, just hold on just a minute, will you? <laughs> Don't be jumping that far ahead, okay? What was, what was Aaron's uh, uh, livelihood? What did he do? He was a high priest. He was a goldsmith. He was a goldsmith. He was a goldsmith. All right. And while Moses was up there communing with God, El Shaddai, the all-powerful one, Jehovah Jireh, all of this, he's up there on this mountain. They're down there and they said to Aaron, show us God. Well, they'd already seen him and they were so afraid of him they wouldn't be around him. He said, show us God. So, uh, he took some metal. He carved out a, uh, the likeness of a calf and he took gold and pounded it over this calf and he said, that's Jehovah that, that led you out of Egypt. <laughs> Aaron did that. He said, this is Jehovah that led you out of Egypt, so they called that calf Jehovah. I'm going to tell you something. 
When Moses come down off that mountain, he burnt that calf up and he pounded it in a little bitty piece. He said, now you drink your God. That's ungodly. That's paganism. We are a people that believe in God. We don't have to have Him all the time with us right now, do we? We believe that He is. The book of the writer of the book of Hebrews says we must believe that He is. All right? Had four faces, it says. Verse number 15, the cherubim rose up, and they are the living beings that I saw by the river Shebar. Now when the cherubim moved, the wheels would go beside them, and all the cherubim lifted up. What's going on here? He's talking about the Shekinah glory of God getting ready to exit. He's getting ready to leave them in their sin for a while and just let them waller in it until they get tired of it. And then they were drug off and hauled off in the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. And once they got over there and got their bellies full of paganism, they didn't want any more. But they made one great mistake when they were down in those, in those lands. What was the mistake that they made? They're still, they want a God that they can see and one that they can feel. Don't they? What did they do down there? They established... They established what did they establish? What form of worship did they establish in this place? What? Oh yeah. No. What form of what form of worship did they establish down there? The synagogues. The synagogue. Synagogue. And by the way, they were speaking Greek. What's the term for synagogue in Hebrew? Moed. When the Jews talk about their synagogues, they don't call them their moeds, do they? They call them their synagogues. They still haven't left that Greek language behind, still. But when they got down there, they began to worship God's Word instead of God. They still will worship God. When you go over there to the Wailing Wall today, you'll see those Jews carry out the scrolls. And they'll be kissing those scrolls and, and beating their heads on that Wailing Wall and kissing the Bible. Don't kiss the Bible. We, we study the Bible to, so we can see God and see where we stand with God. That's our instruction manual. But it is not it is not an object of worship. It is a way to show us how to worship. Well, they still didn't get it right. Haven't got it right yet. Not yet. Now let's go on down a little further. It's still talking about the theophany. Verse number 15 now, uh, uh, Brother John the Baptist. Uh, verse number 15, 10 and verse number 15 in Ezekiel. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chabar. All right. And go ahead in verse number 16. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. All right. And this read number 17 now. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. All right. Now number verse number 18. This is very important. You can circle this verse or something. Okay. This is extremely important. Okay. Then the Shekinah of Jehovah. What does it say there in, uh, in that Hebrew? <clears throat> And when the book, <coughs> and when the glory of Jehovah went forth from all the, the threshold of the house, he stood over the cherubims. Okay, now the, jar, the the glory, the Shekinah of Jehovah. Jehovah left that temple. He left the temple. Now, according to Second Maccabees, the second chapter, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and all the furniture? What's it say there? What happened to them according to Jewish history? Jeremiah the prophet being born by God did what? He took the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and went over there in the mountain in where it is Jordan today into that mountain where Moses looked over and he saw the promised land. And in a cave in that mountain God had Jeremiah hide the Ark of the Covenant. So probably that's where it is today instead of all these other exciting places like the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark will have you believe. <laughs> or Egypt. Was it Egypt? Egypt. <clears throat> a 
I've actually given me trouble today. <laughs> About knocked me down. <clears throat> when the cherubim, cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth and the side of the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of God of Israel hovered over them. The eastern gate. Where is that? Got my cane today, too. Do you see that gate right there? Do you see the ark? Do you see the, the, the mosque of Omar there? And right here is the eastern gate. That's it. That's where the Shekinah glory of God left. That's also called the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate is where they would take the sacrificial sheep and take them in, lead them in to be sacrificed. Jesus walked into that gate. Jesus walked out of that gate. Jim? Yes? At 19 in this Bible, I have a very good translation of that if you'd like to hear it that way. Okay. Then the cherubims lifted, uplifted their wings and arose from the earth before mine eyes as they went forth, the wheels also in unison with them, and stood at the opening of the gate of the house of Jehovah that was towards the east, and the glory of Elohim of Israel All right. them shit above. All right, the glory of the God of Israel, the Shekinah of the God of Israel, left the city, never to return. By the way. Never to return. Left there, now let's go on and see. Now I want you to draw some conclusions here also. Jesus went in and out of that city. Do you know that the, in, from the writings of Daniel, we know when the Messiah was going to be born. And those of uh, the Magi, we get a word magistrate from that, they were the rulers of the eastern part of uh, the world. And they were magi that were left in Babylon. And they say that they had, when Daniel was there, that they had a school of magi that studied the writings of the Old Testament scrolls. And they knew the very year that the Messiah was going to be born. And when the calendar was right and the year was there, then what did they do? They weren't looking for him. And of course it said that, that his star was in the sky. Not only his star was in the skies, but it was a time for him to be born. Also, they knew the exact day when Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on his triumphant entry. Also. On his triumphant entry. And when Jesus uh, came into Jerusalem, Riding on that donkey. Remember what he said? He said, go out and he said, uh, look for a donkey that had never been ridden before. You know, Jesus can tame all the wild animals. When he was out there in the wilderness for 40 days, who was coming to him and who was he communicating with? The wild animals, the animals of the wilderness. The Aramu, the wilderness, the desert. Well, they brought that, and by the way, that was uh, a prophecy, wasn't it? That they would go out and they would get this donkey. They would come in riding on a pole, the pole of a donkey, into Jerusalem. And what did they say? What did all the people, everybody was excited. What were they hollering? Hosanna. Hosanna, in his highest. And you know, the Jews came up there and said, and says, tell your disciples... Not to say this. Tell your disciples not to say that. Why? They thought he wasn't a What? They thought he wasn't God. Because if they said this is Hosanna, this is Jehovah riding in to take over his kingdom. And he did come in there, that he rode in there on that donkey, and where did he go? The temple. Into the temple area. Not in the temple itself, but into the temple area on the outer courts of the temple where the money changers were, where they were selling the sacrifices. 
people would bring their sacrifices from afar and they would get there and the priest would uh, nullify that. Well, this has got a mark on it here or something wrong with it. But we have one over here we'll sell you at a good price today. But we won't take your money. We will, you'll have to exchange your money for temple money. And they would sit there at their benches. The bankers would. Now, in the, some of you heard this a lot of times, but in the, in the pagan temples were all banks. In the pagan temples, in the Roman and the Greek times, they had banks in every one of them. And the priest in there, one of the priests was, was set aside as the banker. And he would be ordained as the banker, and people would come and invest their money in that pagan temple, and they could get money, interest on it. They could make money on it. Now, if that priest became unfaithful and corrupt and debunked, what we call, what do you call that today when somebody goes and scams some, some company or everything? It's called what? Embezzlement. What? Embezzlement. Embezzlement. If he became an embezzler, they would take him and publicly whip him and break his bench in the presence of all. Now, what did Jesus do in there? He made a whip. He broke their benches and said, you are bankrupt. And he took over his king. He took over his kingdom. The king took over the king. All right. And then what did they do to the king? What did they do to the king? They crucified the king and they whipped him because they had power to do so. Pontius Pilate five times. Remember when I preached about Pontius Pilate over there? Pontius Pilate declared Jesus innocent five times, but the Jews kept on saying, crucify him, crucify him. They demanded his crucifixion. And he said what? Pontius Pilate washed his hands and said, I am guiltless of this man's innocent blood. And he said, let it be upon what? Us and our children. All right. This is quite a bit, quite a story. In it. it is repeated over and over and over again. It? Jesus looked over to, to the Jerusalem. He said, you will not see me again until you, until you say what? Baruch Hashem. Blessed and holy is he that came in the name of the Lord. Bless and holy is he that came in the name of the Lord. And in, and in the last day, in the last days, there's one that's going to stand up here. In the, right over here, there's one that's going to stand up. And what is he going to say? <coughs> I'm the Messiah. Come and follow me. And I'll give everything into your hands. I'll take care of you. I'm going to make the world a safe place. Remember we talked about here, here a while back, we talked about no God, no guns, and no gold. No silver and no food. No Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Remember we talked about that here just a while back? The, pro, the, the, the plan of the Antichrist? Today they, they say uh, invest in God and guns and gold. Well, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, you're not going to have any guns. Your gold and silver is going to be worthless. And even today, with your social security number, can you get a hunting license without a social security number? No. How about a fishing license? How about a job? How about a bank account? How about a checking account? How about going to the doctor? Go to the hospital? You got to have it. It's already there, isn't it? All of a sudden, somebody just snaps their fingers and we're done for. <laughs> That's the way it is. No God, no guns, no gold. And they think that they're going to. But what's the Bible say? Invest in gold. It's a standard, isn't it? I'm going to tell you something. In America, one time all the gold was called in and they set a price. The government set a price of what the gold was. Took it all away. Remember in 9-11? When President Bush shut down all the banks, you couldn't do anything at all. You couldn't draw any money out. You couldn't do anything. What's good is your money in the bank when all this takes place? All it takes place. Well, let's go on and look a little bit further. Let's see the rest of the story. All right.
he tells out that he's going to uh, now here at the eastern gate is the Shekinah glory of God then he tells them the story in verse number 5 the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and he said to me say thus to, thus says the Lord so you think the house of Israel for I know your thoughts you have multiplied your slain in this city filling its streets with them therefore thus saith the Lord God your slain whom you have laid in the midst of the city are the flesh and this city is the pot but I shall bring you out of it and you have feared a sword and I will bring a sword upon you and the Lord God declares this and I shall bring you out of the midst of the city and shall deliver you into the hands of the strangers and execute judgments of God upon you is this what's going to happen to these people they're going to be carried off for you will fall by the sword and I shall judge you to the border of Israel so you shall know that I am the Lord and this city will not be a pot for you nor will you be flesh in the midst of it but I shall judge you as to the board of Israel I go on down verse number 13 and it came about as I prophesied that Eliathiah the son of Benaiah died then I fell on my face and cried out with a loud voice and said alas the Lord God will you bring the remnants of Israel to a complete end he's not going to completely destroy Israel then the word of the Lord came to me now with all this judgment with all the things that God does sometimes and brings upon us and his you know Israel is a type of us and I want to tell you something it's a type of us and using a southern term The reason why we have that Old Testament is we can see what we are like. The word of the Lord came in saying, Son of man, your brothers and your relatives and your fellow exiles and the whole house of Israel, all of them are those whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord to this land and has been given us as a possession. Verse number 16, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Though I have removed you far from the far away nations, among the nations, and though I have scattered them among the count countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. God was going to protect them wherever they went. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I shall gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among where you have been scattered, and I shall give you the land of Israel. And then verse down to 22. Verse number 22 now. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings and the wheels beside them in the glory of the Lord of Israel. Who is this glory of the Lord? This is the Shekinah. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain which is in the east of the city. Now Jerusalem, after he told his little church to meet him there in Jerusalem, and he appeared to them, and he told them to hang around there for a while because he said I'm going to send uh, power from on high to you alright and then on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of the book of Acts we find that the Shekinah glory of God rested upon that little church and empowered them to take out the gospel to the world alright and when Jesus uh, was uh, about to leave this earth for the last time where did he go Acts the second chapter. Where did Jesus go? To the Mount of Olives. The Shekinah glory when it left Israel back in the days of Ezekiel. Where did the Shekinah glory go? To the Mount of Olives. And when Jesus was lifted up, they said, O man of, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking? In a like manner, he's going to return to you. Where is Jesus going to come back? Where's his foot going to touch? The mouth of all it's again. Is that why it, the Shekinah glory left through the east gate? That's right. It went through the east gate. It went to the Mount of Olives. Right to the Mount of Olives. All right. And the, and the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain which is east of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the vision of the Spirit of God to the exiles in Chaldee so that the vision that I had seen left me. All right. And then it talks about far off times. Far off times. We're going to start 
there next week. That's where the, the glory of Israel left. That's where the Shekinah glory of God left. Thank you for your uh, enduring those hard seats today and your participation in the classes. Thank you for putting up with me as I'm almost falling down up here. Uh, <coughs> my back is about cut me in two today. I lifted my mother in the hospital the other day and I never have got over it yet. <laughs> I'm doing all the other things I'm supposed to do. But uh, anyway, Brother David, you want to come up here? Come back next week and we'll look at some more of this. Okay, on our prayer list today, uh, Anna would like to give praise that her mom's tumor has shrunk. And it's half the size. And we'd also like to keep praying that it shrinks further.